That is good. Constant speed of 10 meters per second from right to left in the direction of the arrows along the curved path shown in the diagram. Um, <coughs> what do we make of that sentence? Constant speed. Let's just carefully read and extract information from what we read. The symbol handwritten V equal to 10 meters per second. Uh, better yet, it's a constant. Uh, which tells me that the time rate of change of speed is going to equal a nice big happy zero, yes? <coughs> the other thing I can see, if that dotted line is the motion path, I can see that this straight line at 60 degrees is the tangent line. So I can visualize what the unit tangent vector looks like. <coughs> the unit tangent vector is clearly left and up over and to the left, angled up at 60 degrees. Cosine of 60 degrees is 1 half, so you're going to have a minus 1 half component in the x direction and a radical 3 over 2 component in the y direction. By the way, while we're at it, we probably need this at some point in our analysis, is it also clear what the unit normal to the path looks like? The unit normal is perpendicular to the tangent, pointing inward. So you can see if I were to draw an arrow at 30 degrees up and to the right, I'd be looking at the unit normal vector. So we can also extract that information. That's going to be plus cosine of 30, radical 3 over 2 in the x direction, plus 1 half sine of 30 in the east of y direction. <coughs> so I get all of that information. OK. <coughs> Part A says determine the polar coordinates at this point. Uh, that, that's an easy one because, of course, uh, the distance from the z-axis, or in this case, the origin, two-dimensional problem is going to be square root of x squared plus y squared. And of course, that square root of 169 is going to be exactly 13 meters. <coughs> and the polar angle is the angle measured from the x-axis to that radial line. That would be this angle right in here. So you can see that that would be the inverse tangent of 12 over 5, inverse tangent of 2.4, which is about uh, 60, 67.4 degrees. But as I, uh, I think I pointed out to you, it's not the angle that's so important. It's, it's its cosine value and its sine value, which you're going to need in the course of your analysis. And the cosine of that angle is obviously going to be adjacent over hypotenuse, 5 over 13. And the sine is going to be 12 over 13. So those are exact expressions for the sine and cosine. So there's your part A. Part B says we're supposed to determine the first polar rates, r dot and theta dot. And given what we already know over here, and given that we have an expression for velocity that contains those things, I have an idea. I'm going to say that the velocity vector on the one hand is going to be the speed in the tangent direction. On the other hand, it can be written as r dot e sub r <coughs> plus r theta dot e sub theta. And I put in all the stuff we know. We know the speed. We know the tangent vector. If you take the product of the speed and the tangent vector, put those guys in, put this guy in here, and put this guy in here, multiply your 10 through, and you see you're going to get a velocity vector of minus 5 e sub x plus 5 radical 3 e sub y is equal to r dot e sub r plus the value of r at this moment is 13, so I'm going to put it in there. It is 13 times theta dot e sub theta. So I have this nice little equation. Cartesian expression equal cylindrical expression. If you want r dot, I have an idea. Why don't you take that equation and dot it on both sides with the radial unit vector? If you dot on both sides with the radial, dot both sides of the equation through with the radial unit vector. And that's going to give me an equation that says minus 5 er dot ex. I asked you to bring in that little matrix so you'd have it in front of you. <coughs> er dot ex is cosine plus 5 radical 3 <coughs> er dot ex sine. And I will just tell you that when you uh, Put in your 5 thirteenths and your 12 thirteenths and solve for r dot. I'll let you do the numerics yourself. 
<coughs> we get that R dot turns out to be about 6.071 when you substitute into that equation. 6.071 meters per second. Positive. <coughs> so R is getting bigger, right? Does that make sense when you look at the picture that this particle is moving in the process of moving further away from the z-axis? That looks right to me. Uh, to get the uh, theta dot, we're going to dot this equation on both sides with the transverse unit vector. And that's going to lead to an equation that says minus, minus 5 times ex dotted with e theta. That's negative sine of theta if I'm, if I'm remembering that little matrix correctly. <coughs> Plus 5 radical 3 times um, e sub theta dotted with ey, which is cosine, positive cosine. And of course, that's got to equal 13 times theta dot. And of course, you're going to take that whole equation, you're going to put in your sine and cosine, and you're going to divide the whole thing by 13 to solve for theta dot. And when you do, you should get, you should be able to show that theta dot turns out to be positive 0.611. 0.611. By the way, a little habit that, uh, that you might have, a little uh, technique that you might want to remember, these are rounded off, of course. These are rounded to three decimal places. But you've got fancy. My $10 Casio calculator, which is my favorite calculator ever, has six memories in it, A through F. So when I calculate a number that I know I'm going to need later, I could round it off and write it down. But I, as soon as I calculate my calculator, uh, I, I know I'm going to need this number later, uh, I store it. So I say, store that number in memory location A. And, this, and when this comes up on the screen, I'll store that in memory location B. So I know I've got those things saved. I can use them in exact form uh, later on when I need them. OK, so that's the result of part B of the problem. What's part C? Determine the radius of curvature given an additional piece of information. You say that additional piece of information is that theta double dot has a value of negative 2. <coughs> OK, well, what's the plan there? The plan there, for me anyway, is to say, why don't we choose an expression uh, that uh, allows me to use the stuff that I know. I think this is the one that allows me to use, make use of all this cylindrical coordinate information. And then use another expression, which contains the stuff we're looking for. Well, that expression would be this one. Two different expressions, cylindrical expression, path expression. But remember, our particle's moving with a constant speed. So that's all. That's cool. <coughs> so that term is going to be 0. <coughs> By the way, let's, um, as we go through this thing, let's identify what's known and what isn't known. At the moment of interest, is, is, is this guy r double dot? We don't know that, do we? So I'll put a squiggle and a question mark. We, we know the value of r. We know the value of theta dot. That's stored neatly in my memory location b. So I can call that number back anytime I want. Uh, r is value 13. Theta double dot, well, yes, we know it now because they've told us this, that's that extra piece of information, right? The extra piece of information was that theta double dot was minus 2. So that guy gets a check as well. R dot's the number stored in memory location A. Theta dot's stored in memory location B. So we've got all of that stuff. The speed is known. That's 10. And there's the thing you're looking for in this part of the problem. And how about, the, how about this guy? That's known as well. Uh, so, uh, by the way, given that the two unknowns in this problem are r double dot and rho, which is in this term, uh, and given that they didn't ask for r double dot, what, what was your, what's your strategy? What's your plan? Dot with e sub theta. Okay. I'll tell you what, I'm going to let you finish this off. This is going to be, this is, on, on this side of the equation, you're going to have 100 over rho. Uh, the principal normal was what? Radical 3 over 2 e sub x plus 1 half e sub y. So you're going to have your speed squared divided by the radius of curvature in the normal direction dotted with e sub theta. You're going to have that over here. On the other side of the equation, when you dot through with e sub theta, that disappears. You're just going to have 
uh, r theta double dot plus 2 r dot theta dot. Uh, 13 minus 2, memory A, memory B, right? Um, uh, you're going to have a, a minus sine of theta and a cosine of theta. Just go through and take this equation and manipulate it around and solve for the radius of curvature. I'll leave the gory details to you. But when you do the algebra and make the substitutions, you should be able to show that the radius of curvature is 3.268 to three decimal places. And of course, radius of curvature would have units of meters. Okay, so there's the strategy for uh, taking this problem apart. Any questions about that? I don't. I didn't post the solution. I did post the problem, so you have a, you have this that you can download. But you've taken good notes, so see so you know what the solution looks like. Uh, okay, so we've done I think three good two-dimensional problems. Uh, let's do a couple three-dimensional problems. <clears throat> the first one. Problem taken from an old book. Um, my my main complaint about this problem is that the units seem a little uh, nonsensical. You will notice that the scale of this problem is very very small because they show a parabolic bowl and they describe. Uh, <coughs> well, we'll read the sentence in a moment. But first of all, everything is happening on the surface of this parabolic bowl, and the position of interest is when the r is equal to z is equal to one inch which seems like we're dealing with this thing on a sort of ridiculously small scale. But nonetheless, we'll do the problem the way it's stated, even though it doesn't seem very realistic in that sense. OK. A laser beam is projected horizontally from a light source, which is attached to a carrier, which is threaded onto a vertical screw shaft just situated along the center line of this bowl. Now, the equation for this bowl, the equation is the equation, the equation describing the surface of the bowl is that z is equal to r squared. Now, that's the equation for the surface in cylindrical form. If you remember that the radial coordinate is the square root of x squared plus y squared, if you wanted to write this, I guess, in the more traditional Cartesian form, surface z equal f of x, y, this would be the Cartesian equation describing the surface of that bowl. But we're going to use cylindrical coordinates. So uh, that's the expression that we want. That's the equation describing the bowl. All right, in any case, this little carrier shooting out this little laser beam is rotating at a constant angular speed. It's screwing itself down as it lowers down into the bowl. So, so that you can see that light beam is, is going, it's being projected out like this. So that light beam is tracing a spiraling path on the inside surface of the bowl. Given that the screw shaft has a pitch of three inches per revolution, and that the carrier is moving downward as it rotates at a constant angular speed of one radian per second, get a lot of information here. Let's keep it, let's organize it. Let's organize all this information so we don't lose things. Let's create this little matrix where we can kind of gather up all the things that we're encountering here. What's the first number that jumps at, out at you from that first initial paragraph? Well, well, for one thing, way at the top, the position of interest. They want, us, they want us to determine the velocity and acceleration at the point where z is equal to r is equal to 1. I'll keep everything in inches. So that's a number that jumps. There's a couple ones on, in this paragraph. So the position of interest is when r and z are both equal to 1. Uh, the other thing that jumps out at me is this one. There's another one, one radian per second. What is that? That's going to be theta dot, right? So you've got a one. And since that's a constant value, I guess the second rate of change of theta would be a nice happy zero. Notice how our matrix is filling up rather nicely. <coughs> There's another number in there, three, three inches per revolution. That's the pitch. <coughs> What's the definition of the pitch of a screw thread? The pitch is equal to the change in elevation 
pitch is changing elevation per revolution. Uh, per two pi, let's put it this way. The pitch is the ratio of the change in elevation to the change in angle. That's the definition of pitch. And in this case, for a, for a rotation of one revolution or two pi radians, we know that the thing goes down three inches. So as a matter of fact, uh, that's inches per revolution. So that right there is the definition of pitch. And that gives us the proportionality between changes in elevation and changes in angle. So during any period of time, during any interval of time, the change in elevation is going to be minus 3 over 2 pi times whatever the change in angle was. Now, if that period of time was delta t, I guess we could divide through by that. And you could take a limit as delta t goes to 0. And you would ascertain from this that the vertical velocity, z dot, must be equal to minus 3 over 2 pi times theta dot. And if you took another time derivative of that, I guess you could also ascertain that the vertical acceleration, z double dot, is going to be minus 3 over 2 pi times theta double dot, making use of this thing called the pitch. All right? So since theta dot is 1, this is going to be minus 3 over 2 pi times 1. <coughs> and since this is equal to 0, this is going to be minus 3 over 2 pi times 0. So there's another 0 pi. You know you've chosen the right kind of coordinates to describe your problem when the little number starts showing zeros in it. Zeros are nice, easy to work with. Now, how are we going to get these things? Well, we're going to get those things from this. Now, in this old problem, the author um, uh, thought it was necessary to give that hint. Um, I would not think it's necessary to give that hint. And if I were to rework this problem, I would probably change the numbers to make it more realistic. But I would also not give that hint. Because you know that as this problem proceeds, we know that these coordinates are theta and z. We know that those coordinates are all functions of time, yes? They're all going to be dynamically changing. But we know that the r and the z coordinates, coordinate functions have to be consistent with this constraint equation because the light spot is always on the surface of the bowl. So this is just what we did before in Cartesian analysis. If that's true, what happens if you take one derivative? What happens if you take another? One time derivative is going to say that the vertical velocity, z dot, is going to be 2r times r dot. And another derivative is going to tell me that z double dot is equal to 2 times derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. Uh, that's something that I would presume that you know how to do, that you shouldn't have to have uh, this hint to get that. Okay. In any event, uh, what the only thing that's missing in our little information matrix are the values of r dot and r double dot. But it seems to me we can get them from the constraint equation. So from the first constraint equation, you can see that r dot, by the way, r is equal to 1 at the moment of interest. So you can see that at the moment of interest, r dot is going to be 1 half of z dot. So whatever z dot is, this is going to be 1 half of it. That's going to be minus 3 over 4 pi right there. And then from the second derivative constraint relation, z double dot is equal to 0. And r is equal to 1. So I think you can see what comes out of that is that r double dot is going to be equal to the negative of r dot squared. You're going to get that r double dot at the position of interest is going to be minus, <coughs> minus r dot squared. <coughs> So our last little matrix position is going to be equal to minus the square of this, 9 over 16 pi squared. And our <coughs> information matrix is full, except for theta, which it doesn't really matter because it doesn't enter into the equations. At this point, you just go to page 2 of the general course outline, and you look up the expression for velocity. The expression for velocity is cylindrical expression is r dot, r dot in the radial direction plus the product of r theta dot, 1 times 1, in the transverse direction, plus z dot, 
minus 3 over 2 pi in the vertical direction. And the units would be inches per second. <coughs> There's your expression for velocity. Your expression for acceleration. Uh, again, you're look staring at the sheet right there. The uh, radial component is angle dot. R double dot minus <coughs> R theta dot minus 1 in the radial direction. The transverse component is R theta double dot <coughs> 0 plus 2 times the product of R dot and theta dot. So that's going to be equal to minus 3 over 2 pi in the transverse direction when the substitutions are made. And then the third component, of course, is just your z double dot, which is 0. So there's your acceleration vector in units of inches per second square. <coughs> and that is exactly what they asked for in part A. Determine the velocity and acceleration of the light spot as it moves along the surface of the bowl through the position where r is equal to z is equal to 1. It is easiest, it is easiest to express these vectors in cylindrical form. Of course it is, because the problem lends itself nicely to the use of cylindrical coordinates. <coughs> I shouldn't have to spend much time on part B. Explain, show how these vectors can then be used to quickly determine the instantaneous speed, rate of change of speed, and radius of curvature of the path at that point. Uh, once you've got your vectors expressed in nice standard form relative to any orthogonal basis, you can now just plug right into those three little equations at the bottom of page one of the general course outline to determine what you need. Okay. Any questions about that? It's pretty straight. Sometimes the three-dimensional problems are uh, simpler, even more straightforward than the two-dimensional problems are. And again, in this problem, if I were to redo this or modernize this problem, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have given that hint. I would assume that's something you should know how to do by now. Let's do a problem involving uh, what I call global coordinates. And that would be this. Um, a particle moves along a path traced on the outer surface of a hemisphere of radius 10 meters. OK, well, I have a feeling, as I already mentioned, that this problem is going to lend itself to global coordinate analysis. So let's prep our information matrix. Global coordinates are capital R, the so-called modular coordinate, the same polar angle <laughs> and cylindrical. And the third global coordinate is the angle of elevation, phi, phi dot, phi double dot. Okay, so. We're ready to go. Now, the first thing is that we're told that this particle moves along the surface, moves on a path traced on the surface of this hemisphere. And the hemisphere has a radius of 10. Therefore, would always be 10 meters from the origin. So that not only, as this particle moves, not only is the value of capital R equal to 10 meters, but its rates of change are both going to be 0. That's a good start. Well, let's, uh, again, continue reading. It says, the geometry of the path is such that changes in the elevation angle, changes in the angle of elevation, or latitude, are directly proportional to changes in polar angle. Latitude. So what they're saying, uh, can I translate that sentence? Changes in the elevation angle are directly proportional to changes in polar angle. There must be some, if that's true, there must be some constant of proportionality. <coughs> Continue reading. And that this path makes exactly two complete turns about the z-axis as it rises from the base all the way to the top. So the path goes twice around the z-axis and going all the way up. Uh, in going from the base to the top, what's been the change in your elevation angle? <coughs> 90 degrees, or pi over 2 radians. The elevation at the base is 0. Angle of elevation at the base is 0. The angle of elevation at the top is 90 degrees. So the 
in going from the base to the top, you've changed your elevation angle by pi over 2. And given that you've gone around the z-axis two times, what's been the change in your polar angle? 4, four pi, right? And from that, it's pretty clear to me that that constant of proportionality <coughs> must be 1 over 8. It tells me that the constant of proportionality must be 1 8 which tells me that, OK, delta phi equal to 1 8th of delta theta during any interval of time. <coughs> Divide by delta t and take a limit. That's going to be the elevation angle is going to be 1 8th the time rate of change of the polar angle. And take another derivative. It's going to tell me that the second rate of change of the elevation angle is going to be 1 8th the time rate of change, the second rate of change of the polar angle. Those are all little equations which are going to help me maybe fill in this last column over here when the time comes. <coughs> Continue to read. If the particle motion along this path is characterized by constant polar rotation rate, if theta dot is constant during this motion, and assuming that it takes exactly 12 seconds to travel from the base to the top, uh, determine various things. So they say that it's moving with a constant theta dot. It's going to give me a 0 here, isn't it? Oh, it's going to give me a 0 over here. <coughs> and we also have that we can still use. Let's see. So basically, uh, in going from the base to the top, remember we've moved through a total polar angle of what, 4 pi? And they're telling us that this happens at a constant rate in how many seconds? 12 seconds. So let's see. Hmm. So would you say that the uh, ratio of delta theta to delta t is going to be 4 pi over 12 or pi over 3? And since everything's happening at a constant rate, this is your constant angular rotation speed polar rate anyway. So you can see from that argument that this constant theta dot is just going to be pi over 3 radians per second. So you get a pi over 3 in here, radians per second. And then the th this one is going to be pi over 24. So our matrix is pretty much full, um, except for the values of the angles at this point. Let's read, continue to read the question. Uh, part A, they want the velocity and acceleration vectors for this particle as it passes through the position where the elevation angle is 60 degrees. So they're identifying the position of interest. 60 degrees, or I guess you could say pi over 3 radians, take your pick. Okay, so that's the location of interest. Uh, and it says these <coughs> vectors, velocity and acceleration vectors, are best expressed in terms of global components. And I would say, of course, that's pretty obvious in this case, that global coordinates is the way to go. The geometry of the problem lends itself to that sort of analysis. Now. Uh, I mentioned that I don't want to keep bringing this up, but this, I'm going to make an exception here. Let's bring up the page two of the general course outline and focus on the global expressions for velocity and acceleration. Now, help me out. <coughs> the uh, velocity vector, uh, we can now write a global expression for it by substituting our matrix entries into this expression right here. Notice that r dot is equal to 0. There is no first component. Uh, the second component is going to be what? R theta dot cosine of phi. Oh, by the way, cosine of 60 degrees. Cosine of phi, in this case, is going to be equal to 1 half. And sine of phi is going to be equal to sine of 60 is going to be equal to radical 3 over 2. Yes? In any event, the first component of the velocity is 0. The next component is going to be 10 times pi over 3. times cosine of the angle of elevation, 1 half. That's the transverse component. <coughs> and the third component is just going to be the product of the capital R and phi dot. That's going to be 10 times pi over 24. That's that northerly component of the velocity. And the units are meters and seconds. So just make your substitutions. Now the acceleration vector, as you can see down here, 
Uh, it's kind of hard to write it all out in one, one line, so we'll just we'll compute the components separately. And all I have to do is carefully transcribe. And the first scalar component, global component, is going to be given by this formula. And you'll notice that when you substitute from our array over there, our double dot's zero. So you just get the two uh, negative terms. So it's going to be, I guess we can factor out the minus 10. Minus 10, there's your minus r, times phi dot squared, <coughs> pi over 24 squared. Let's do a square bracket. Pi over 24 squared plus theta dot squared, pi over 3 squared, times cosine squared. Cosine of 60 is a half. So you just make the substitutions and bang it out on your calculator. The transverse component of acceleration is given by this equation, which isn't even fully expanded out because they haven't expanded this derivative. Uh, but notice, uh, in, during this motion, isn't capital R constant? And theta dot is constant? So this, this thing in here is constant. And the time derivative of a constant is Zero, so that term is, doesn't give you a thing. So all you have is the minus 2r theta dot phi dot minus 2 times 10 times theta dot pi over 3 times phi dot pi over 24. And then there's a factor times a sine of the angle of elevation, which of course is your radical 3 over 2. So just bang it out with your calculator. And the third component, scalar global component is going to be equal to what you get out of this equation. But again, this term is constant during this motion. Derivative of constant is 0. So all you get is the second term. 10 times pi over 3 squared times the product of sine of the elevation angle times cosine of the elevation angle. So just bang it out and you'll have your numbers in there. And at the end of this, you will have nice standard form representations for your velocity, particle velocity, and acceleration vectors <coughs> uh, relative to the global orthonormal basis. Okay. Um, <coughs> the next part of the problem was the same as the previous one. Could, how would you use those vectors to determine the particle's instantaneous speed, rate of change of speed, and radius curvature of the path? Plug and chug into equations at the bottom of page one. Let me add a C part to this, though. Let me add a C part. Um, what if there was a part C that said, determine the instantaneous vertical acceleration component? <coughs> determine the instantaneous acceleration in the vertical upward direction. What's the component of velocity in the or acceleration, I should say, in the upward direction? Well, uh, let's not waste. Let's not waste the thing that you just computed. E theta, E sub phi. We've got an expression with numbers here now, right? That's the global expression for the particle's acceleration. <coughs> but there's also, is there also not a Cartesian expression? X double dot, E sub x plus uh, y double dot e sub y plus z double dot e sub z. And, and isn't z double dot? z double dot is exactly that vertical component that you're looking for, assuming that z is the upward direction. This is what you're looking for. Well, what would you do to solve for that number, given making use of the work you've already completed by the method of projections? You would just dot this thing with e sub z. When you do that with e sub z, you'll discover that the vertical acceleration, that's all you're going to get from this side of the equation, is going to be equal to the number a sub r that's computed on the, over there, e capital R dotted with e sub z, plus uh, the number a sub theta that you computed over there, e sub theta dotted with e sub z, plus the a sub phi, e sub phi dotted with e sub z. And of course, to finish this off, that's where you would bring in that <coughs> dot product matrix down here. 
And uh, if you go across the E sub Z line, E sub Z dotted with E sub theta is zero, E sub Z dotted with E sub R is sine of the angle of elevation, and the other one is plus cosine of the angle of elevation. Bang it out, and you'll have the vertical acceleration. Could we also have done that with that? Uh, sure. Yeah, you could have. You could have. You could have had your your. You could have used this. You could have had the cylindrical expression here as well, in terms of your a little r and a little theta, like so, because that's per the same thing will happen. You'll get exactly the same equation in the end. Okay. All right. So I'm going to start uh, another one, and this one's kind of a <coughs> interesting exercise. I'm not going to use the projector for this. <coughs> so let's. This problem asks us to determine the break down the geometry of a cylindrical helix. Geometry of a cylindrical helix. And first of all, we've got to uh, make sure we know what a cylindrical helix is. So I'll, I'm going to put in a nice fixed cohesion system, x, y with z vertical. I'm going to draw a picture of a cylinder that has the z-axis as its center axis. Now, when you talk about a cylinder, the important geometric parameter to know about is the diameter of the cylinder. So let's assume that we're given that diameter. It's in our list of givens. Now, a cylindrical helix is a spiraling path that's drawn up along the outer surface of the cylinder. And it's a path that has a constant pitch. In other words, the rise is always directly proportional to the angle going around. So you can see this cylinder going like this, going around and around, like so. Now the important thing to know there, the total change in elevation per rotation. So remember, by definition, pitch is equal to the delta z over the delta, well, it's, it's delta z per rev. So in any case, <coughs> let's assume that pitch is known. Um, and, it, and again, the ratio during the motion, during, well, the geometry of, of this helix is such that for any segment of the curve, the change in elevation over the change in elevation, let's put it this way, what's the change in elevation for one revolution? That would be the pitch. The change in elevation for one revolution is the pitch. And what angle does that correspond to? One revolution corresponds to 2 pi. So the pitch gives us the proportionality between changes in elevation and changes in polar angle through this equation. So we'll keep that in mind. That's the relevance of the pitch. And that is assumed to be known. Now, imagine that we took this cylinder and that I taped a piece of paper around it. Well, first of all, before I tape the piece of paper, like one of your quizzes, Maybe I'd uh, size that piece of paper so that it goes around one, one time. Okay? So what if I were to take that piece of paper and on the back of it, so I've sized it so this dimension is equal to the circumference. And this dimension I choose to be equal to the pitch. I want that piece of paper to fit nicely right around there. Uh, uh, then I'll just draw a diagonal line like this, label it with an L. Now, if I were to take that piece of paper and wrap it around there, wouldn't you be looking at one, one turn of a helix? You'll be looking at one turn of a helix. Uh, this angle, by the way, would be defined as what's called the helix angle. We use gamma for the helix angle. There's some obvious relationships here. Remember, we're assuming that the diameter of the cylinder and the pitch are both known. Is it obvious that the length, would this not be the length of one turn of the helix? Is it obvious that L would be equal to the square root of pi d squared plus pitch squared? Is it also obvious that the helix angle would be the arc tangent of uh, a P divided by the circumference pi d? Is it likewise obvious that if you took up uh, that pi d would be equal to, this would be equal to L cosine? Is it also obvious that the pitch would be equal to L times sine of the helix angle? 
So let's also assume that we've, we've, with these definitions of the helix angle length of one turn, let's assume that we've made those calculations. So having been given D and P, we can also compute L, we can compute gamma, et cetera. We can compute those other things. Now, what are we being asked to do in this problem? I've just described to you what a helix looks like. Given all of those things, we're supposed to find at each point on the curve, can we discover what the unit tangent vector is, the unit normal, and the binormal? I want to know, what are the path unit vectors at any point along this curve? A and also, uh, what's the radius of curvature? <coughs> and for fun, let's also throw in the torsion. Remember that thing, torsion, from the Frenet formulas? Can we uh, get an expression for the torsion of a helix? That's what I mean by breaking down the geometry, determine the geometry of a cylindrical helix. OK, well. Here's my idea, uh, especially when I look at these things, e sub t, e sub n, and the radius of curvature, I recognize that those are things that appear in the path expressions for velocity and acceleration. <coughs> Everyone agree with that? By the way, what kind of coordinates does this problem lend itself to? Well, path, yes, we're going to be using those expressions, but also, isn't it quite obvious that cylindrical coordinates are going to work well? But why am I putting down time? Is there any discussion here? Is there any discussion of a moving particle in this problem so far? No, there isn't. But my idea is, why don't we introduce one? Why don't we introduce a test particle to climb this path and use that test particle's velocity and acceleration to try to determine what we're being asked to determine? That, that is, these things right here. So I'm going to take a little bead, drill a hole in it, maybe attach a little electric motor, and I'm going to fit that little bead right onto this wire. I'm going to flip the switch, and that little bead's going to start climbing the wire at a constant rate. So here's this little bead as it's climbing. My little test particle is moving up along the curve. Now, first of all, since that little test particle is on is the helix, how far away is it from the z-axis? half the diameter of the cylinder. <coughs> and it'll always be that far from the z-axis, right? Uh, so my matrix is already filling up with some zeros, my information matrix. Now, this is my test part. And I can adjust it. I can adjust its little electric motor any way that I want. Uh, and I'm going to adjust it so that it's moving at one radian per second. That it, so it takes 6.28 seconds to go around once. So let's move a nice little slow climb. So I'm going to adjust the little motor so that theta dot is constant is equal to 1 radian per second, which will give me another 0 here. I like zeros. And then this equation right here, which gives the proportionality between polar angle and elevation, can be used to realize that the vertical velocity is going to be p over 2 pi times theta dot. But since theta dot is equal to 1, that's going to give me p over 2 pi. <coughs> and again, if you take another derivative of this and make use of the fact that theta dot was constant, theta double dot equal to 0, you'll see that you get yet another 0 in my little information matrix. Okay. Now, with all of that information, can we use our cylindrical formulas to find expressions for the velocity and acceleration. Yes, we can. <coughs> Using the cylindrical equation for velocity, uh, how does that go down? It's r, little r dot e sub r, that's a 0, plus it's um, r theta dot in the transverse direction. And then it's z dot in the vertical direction, plus p over 2 pi in the e sub z direction. And uh, when you substitute those entries into the cylindrical acceleration equation, that's pretty nice because you're going to get uh, r double dot minus r theta dot squared. <coughs> this can give you minus d over 2 in the radial direction. <coughs> Go to the transverse. The transverse component was r theta double dot. 0 plus twice that product, that's 0. You don't get that component. And the third component was just z double dot, which is 0. 
So as a matter of fact, you're done. My, this would be the velocity of my little test particle. This would be its acceleration written in cylindrical form. <coughs> well, how can I use that to determine some of the things we're asked to determine? Isn't the velocity of a particle also expressible like this? Of course it is. So this is what we've got. We've got <coughs> the velocity is equal to d over 2 e sub theta plus p over 2 pi times e sub z. And that's also equal to the speed of my test particle pointing in the instantaneous direction of motion. <coughs> now I'm going to play a little game here for you. And that game goes down, a little algebraic game. And that's going to go down like this. I'm going to divide, I'm going to multiply and divide by pi. And as you can see, that's going to give me an opportunity to factor out <coughs> a common factor. So I'm going to have that 1 over 2 pi times pi d e sub theta plus p e sub z must equal the speed of the particle in the instantaneous direction of motion. One other little thing I'm going to do, I'm going to multiply and divide through by the length of one turn of the helix. <coughs> and I don't know if you can see it, but you recognize these guys right here? Do you recognize uh, those guys right there? Oh, oh, fr from this equation, can you see that pi d over, can you see that pi d over L is equal to cosine of gamma from this equation? And from this equation right here, can you see that uh, uh, pitch over L is the same as sine of the helix angle? Well, of course you can. So really that this equation reduces to what? L over 2 pi, a nice positive number, multiplying cosine of the helix angle in the transverse direction, plus sine of the helix angle in the e sub z direction <coughs> is equal to the particle's speed times its unit tangent vector. Is this a positive number? Is this a positive number? Positive number? Yes. Positive number? Yes. Is this a unit vector? Its magnitude is 1, isn't it? Sine squared plus cosine squared. Is this a unit vector? Two vectors are equal if and only if they have the same magnitude in the same direction. So immediately when you see that, you can immediately conclude that the speed of my test particle is exactly L over 2 pi, which is certainly a constant. We knew it was moving with a constant speed. And the other thing we can de determine just by looking at that equation is that the unit tangent vector is the vector which is cosine of gamma in the tangent direction, uh, cosine of gamma in the transverse direction, plus sine of the helix angle in the vertical e sub z direction. Direct magnitude equal magnitude, direction equal direction, like so. So we're part of the way there. Oh, by the way, this is <laughs> Peel off that label again. Isn't L the total distance traveled by the particle after one revolution? And again, how many seconds did it take the particle to travel that distance, one revolution? It took two pi seconds, right, to travel one revolution. So isn't it obvious? Isn't this an obvious expression for the speed? Distance traveled for one revolution, time that it took for one revolution. Distance over time, certainly that makes sense. And you probably could have seen that, seen that right off. Let's uh, finish up right here. Let's see what we can do with this expression. Now that expression is already good to go using the same kind of arguments that we just made right here. Because we know that the acceleration vector has a path expression. Yes? And we've just discovered by having the information about our test particle that the acceleration was minus d over 2 in the radial direction. But the speed, remember, uh, for our little test particle is constant, so we don't have that expression. That first term is 0, and put it that way. The first term is 0. So what I can do with this expression is write it in the following way. Speed squared over the radius of curvature equal to speed squared over the radius of curvature in the inward pointing principal normal direction is equal to positive number d over 2 
multiplying the unit vector minus e sub r. And again, I ask you, positive number? Yes. Positive number? Yes. Unit vector? Unit vector? Two vectors are equal if and only if they have the same magnitude and point in the same direction. Uh, so therefore, uh, let's do the direction part first. I think I can say that the principal normal is therefore equal to the minus e sub r. Think about that geometrically in a minute. By the way, can we uh, finish off and get the binormal, the third uh, path unit vector? Yes, you can, because this vector is the cross product of this with this. And I assure you, when you do that cross product, uh, e sub z, uh, e sub e z cross to e sub r is e sub theta, so that this term, the second term, is going to give you minus sine of gamma in the e sub theta direction. And the other term, this crossed with this, you're going to get a minus sign, minus e, you're going to get a minus e sub z, minus and a minus is a plus. So when you cross those two, when you cross these two vectors, cross those two to give you the binormal. This is the expression for the binormal unit vector. And one final thing we'll do, and we'll wrap it up right there. Uh, yes, that has to be true. That has to be true. But also the magnitudes have to be the same. So let's see what that gives us. That tells me that v squared over rho would have to be equal to the value of d over 2. Um, OK, or in other words, let's put it over here. I guess I can say that rho is going to be equal to the speed squared divided by d over 2. Just move it around, solve for rho. And the other thing I'm going to do is take this expression. Uh, let's, let's, get, let's get another expression for the speed. The speed was equal to what? L over 2 pi? Uh, would you agree that, that um, L over, would you agree that L over pi, L over pi would be d over cosine of gamma. So that L over 2 pi, or the speed, would equal d over 2 cosine of gamma. Uh, OK, so the speed can be written as d over 2 divided by cosine of the helix angle. Let's make that substitution in here. So if we do, that's going to be d over 2 divided by cosine of gamma quantity squared divided by d over 2. And you'll see that this d over 2 is going to cancel one of those d over 2s, but you're going to end up with cosine downstairs. You end up with an expression that the radius of curvature is the radius of the cylinder divided by cosine squared of gamma. So we're almost done. We've figured this out, this out, this out, and this out. We'll have to finish and get the torsion next time. But let me just make a couple comments about this solution. The radius of curvature of a cylindrical helix is the radius of the cylinder on which it is drawn divided by cosine squared of the helix angle. Now, see if that makes sense. First of all, what if the pitch were 0? What if the pitch were 0? Then what would the helix look like? It would just be a circle. Uh, and then the circle, the radius of curvature of the circle would be the radius of the circle, which would be the d over 2. Uh, helix angle of pitch of 0 corresponds to a 0 valued helix angle, cosine of 0, 0. So you see that makes sense. What happens if the pitch goes to infinity? What kind of a curve are you looking at if the pitch gets very, very big? In the limit, your helix would be of infinite pitch, you'd be looking at a straight line drawn up along the side of the can. The radius of curvature of that would be infinity. So you can see that as, as the helix, as the pitch increases, you're really stretching the curve out and making it straighter, making it flatter. So the bigger the pitch, the flatter the curve is. OK, so we'll finish that example off um, on <coughs> to get the torsion. We'll do some other things with it, but we'll finish that off on Monday.